Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad to see many of you coming in quickly to today's webinar event with Scott Birkin. Today's event is The Greatest Design Lessons, Five Ways to Improve How We Make Everything. And I, I am so excited to learn from Scott Birkin today. As you come in, we would love to communicate with you in the chat. And so I would invite you to quickly take a moment to find the chat. Once you get there, we would encourage you to use the drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees. And that way, everyone who's on this webinar will be able to see your comments and your questions throughout today's events. Uh, so look, looks like Scott found the chat. Awesome. And I, I hope that the rest of you will let us know where you're calling in from today. I see Michael in Mesa, Arizona. I see Marcy in St. Louis and Anne. Uh, hey, see... Anne. I know Anne. Anne's an old friend. Welcome, uh -huh. Anne. Oh, nice. I see Germany and West Virginia, Atlanta, Guatemala, Toledo, Ohio, Iowa, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I hope I said that right. Uh, we have someone in Berlin, India, Chattanooga. Ottawa, amazing. So one quick note, if you are calling in today as part of your professional development or as part of an organization, we would love to hear the name of your organization. And if I see it, I'd be happy to shout you out. Uh, we're always thrilled to have an international audience and I see some more now, India, Johannesburg. Um, so welcome to Marie Christopher, who is representing the Cameron Pub Public Library, uh, someone representing Charles Schwab in Austin, uh, someone representing Perimeter Church, amazing, uh, Get Your Guide, um, Athena Health, Auburn University. Uh, we always love to see those uh, organizational connections. Capital One, uh, Center for Career and Leadership Development at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Um, and looks like this person's organization is called ELC Global. Um, RPM in Washington, Pennsylvania. Wow, all these companies, thank you so much. It looks like someone is from the British Design Council, so that's pretty interesting. Hey! So a few notes about today's session. We are recording and we will make this recording available to anyone who would like to access it later. Uh, also, Scott has some amazing slides that we'll be using uh, to learn. And don't worry about trying to scribble down notes or screenshot the slides. We will provide a PDF of those slides to you after the event. And today, if you'd like to be able to share the insights and your learning in real time, we would invite you to tweet using the hashtag designmtw. MTW stands for makes the world. Uh, the title of Scott's uh, recent book, How Design Makes the World. So Design MTW is today's hashtag. And uh, if you're going to take a picture while I'm on camera, can you make sure I have an okay look on my face <laughs> to all those people who like to screenshot their webinars? Um, all right. So I'm curious if those of you who have joined today have heard of Scott Birkin or read his books before. And I'm going to launch a poll to find out. So how familiar are you with Scott and his work? Are you a fan? Do you know of his work a bit? Or maybe you've never heard of him before. So I have to I have to own that there are a few people in the world whose books I've read before I met them and I'd call myself a fangirl and Scott Birkin is definitely one of those. I picked up his book several years ago. It has a red cover. It's called The Year Without Pants. I loved the book. I read it from cover to cover. Like, how can you not love that? And so when I did later have the opportunity to work with Scott, I was so excited and honored. Um, and some, some of you on the call are also fans of Scott. Let's take a look at these results. It looks like about a quarter of you, 26% are fans of Scott. Another quarter of you know his work a little bit and nearly half of you never heard of Scott before. And for those of you who never heard of Scott before, you are in for a treat today. So let me tell you a bit about Scott and then I'm gonna get out of your way. Scott has a, a keynote style talk. Uh, that will last about 35 minutes, and then we will have some time for open Q&A. So we would invite you throughout today's event to put those questions in the chat. And when I come back on with you, we'll be answering some of those. So about Scott. Scott is a best-selling author and popular speaker on creativity, leading projects, 
public speaking, design, and many other subjects. He is the author of eight books. The one that we're learning from today is the one I mentioned before, How Design Makes the World. He also wrote The Myths of Innovation, Confessions of a Public Speaker, and the book I mentioned before, The Year Without Pants. And uh, Scott's work has appeared in major media publications like The Wall Street Journal, The Economist, Wired, Fast Company, and other outlets. And you can find Scott on all things social media with his name, Scott Birkin, and at his website, scottberkin.com. So Scott, uh, we're really looking forward to today. All right. Thank you, Becky, for that lovely introduction. So before I start with the official laser light show keynote presentation, I need to do my first job as a design-minded person, and I need to learn a little bit about who you are. A presentation is a kind of design thing. So a good designer should know who they're designing for before they give their design thing. So can we run the, the second poll and ask people a little bit about their background? What role best describes you? Now for the intent of being concise in this poll, a lot of roles are not mentioned. Please do not be offended. I'm sure what you do is amazing. You can just pick the option that says amazing role, too cool to be listed here. And you may notice an interesting choice at the bottom of this list is that I understand that it's possible that there's a special guest in the audience who has a unique relationship to me. I'm not sure that my mom's here, but I, be I believe that she is. So hopefully Twice, three times. We will, hopefully we will get one vote for that one. Um, or two uh, or three. Yeah, well, hopefully one. Two might require some design, new design theories to explain how that happened. So can we take a look at the results just so I know who we got here? So. Okay, about a third of you are 25% uh, of designers, 10% engineering management. Good, a nice distribution of folks. And it looks like I now have three moms, which I should be getting more presents than on my birthday. So two of you have some explaining to do. So that helps me a ton. I'm going to now kick into our actual presentation for the day. Planet Earth is where we are. Greatest design lessons. So greatest design lessons could mean a bunch of different things. And I'm sure many of you came in here with a particular, oh, that means I'm an architect. So he's going to talk about the greatest design lessons for me. Or it could mean you're a user experience designer and it's the greatest design lessons of user experience. I mean, all of these things. I look at the world probably like you all do because you're here and I have questions. Why are certain things not designed very well? Why are some of our systems, our websites, the apps that we use, the expense reports that we have to refile. Why are some of these things not designed so well? And I look at the world. I've been teaching design for a long time for, to write this book. I read many, many books and interviews about design, how, how the world should be better. And what you're going to get is a distillation of all of that knowledge and wisdom compressed down into this short talk. My focus, though, is not just design lessons in the classical sense. I'm not talking about aesthetics necessarily or usability. Those are things that are pretty well known. They're lessons that are understood. I'm a lot more interested in why things in the world are the way they are. What are the lessons that we wish everyone would actually apply? Lessons exist. We, it's in the, they're in the books. It's in the knowledge. But when we look at the world, they're not applied. And that's really my mission is how do we close the gap between what's known about design and what actually happens in the world. That's really what we all want to improve. And that's the spirit of what I'm going to share with you today. I'm at the first lesson has to do with the word design itself. And my biggest suggestion for you is that if you are someone who's knowledgeable about design, whether you're a professional or you're just an advocate for design, you want things to be better. Design has some, bag some baggage to it. And the word quality is often a much better word to use. So the lesson is really why it's more effective to talk about quality if you're trying to make better design happen than to use the word design. Part of the reason why is because design is usually thought of as a noun. If you do a search anywhere, you read a headline article that talks about design, they're probably talking about the way things look or maybe the way they feel, maybe the way they work. But it's, it's about the particular moment. It's a noun. It's a thing. The design of a thing. And that tends to be the way most people think about design. That's the superficial layer. It's something that can be done at the end of a project. It's a trivial thing. 
Most people are ignorant of how much work is involved to get these nouns, to create these things, how much iteration and exploration, experimentation and prototyping and research is required to get these results. But in ordinary language, we talk about design as a static thing. I might say, I love my couch, it's so comfortable. I'm talking about the design as if it's in, embedded in the couch itself, it's this static, this static thing. We also take for granted, just in general, how we got to the state of design we have today. The quality of design we have today, we get so excited about these changes and improvements, we forget the context of where it came from. And so we think of the earth and the history of design, the history of design goes all the way back to the first campfires and the first settlements, the first shelters, the first tools. We didn't get these things for free. We had to do the work to develop and experiment through, through evolution as well, our bodies were, were devolving too, but to make these tools and to craft them. And so we have to remember the context in which design comes from. So one question I have for you thinking about this, think about the universe just for a second. Think about the whole universe. And I wanna ask you a question about the universe. So can we put up the next poll question about the universe? Do you think the universe is well-designed? Think about it, that's, that's where we live, that's where we are, it allowed us to be here. It's a simple, you know, yes, no question, unless you want to be existentialist and say that you transcend the universe and you don't want to give us a literal answer. But I want you to think about, like, what do you think about the universe? Does it, whatever you think good design means, does the universe fit into that? Is it, is it well designed in the ways you would evaluate most things in the world? And we forget that the history here of the universe is old, much older than the earth, much older than us. We also forget the context. So I'm poking at this word quality, design and quality. And I think they are very strongly related. So my argument is, we'll take a look at your results in a second. Yeah, many of you say 70% of you think the universe is well designed. So I am here as your webinar lecture person to disagree with you. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that you are probably wrong about that because we have to remember we come, not, not, good design is not for free. So if we think of the universe, the universe is a really big place. The earth is a tiny, tiny pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan has said, tiny little speck. Most of the infinite universe is not hospitable to us, it is not well designed for our survival. If I were to teleport you to any random place in the universe, you would almost certainly die because there's nothing there for you. So from that perspective, the quality of the universe is low. The quality of the universe is low, 99.99999% of it has none of the design constraints, none of the design requirements for you to live. It is the worst kind of design. You could argue the universe is designed to kill us. We happen to live on this tiny little speck where we benefit from a different situation. That's a much better context than to think about design progress. You take the history of any invention or any idea and you go back in time, we're talking about the progression of quality and the ability to experiment and develop ideas and combine them and build on previous invention and previous knowledge to get us forward. This did not happen for free. We had to earn it to get to where we are today. And that says something about how we have to go forward. It's not gonna be for free. The fact that design knowledge exists is not enough. Someone has to put in the work and effort, the costs to make better design happen. So higher quality design depends on things that don't often get talked about in design circles. You need more time or more skill, a more skilled person involved, which is a kind of time to train them or more money, a bigger budget, a bigger schedule to make better design happen. You might fundamentally just need a better organization that the organization that you're in is not mature enough for good design to happen, regardless of who the designer is. Or you might need smarter leaders that are better at organizational politics or project planning. And this is a controversial thing to say as my first lesson about design, but better design primarily depends on what we would say are non-design factors. We tend not to include them in books on design. We tend not to include them in how we teach designers. So we are blind to what are the leading causes of bad design happening. We treat them like it's an other kind of thing. And I am suggesting here that we have to put this back into the center of how we think about design, that it's a kind of quality and the way quality is developed, it's the same tool and pathway we have to be thinking about if we want better design to happen. Which leads into lesson number two. Lesson number two has to do with someone has to pay. Well, if good design 
is a kind of quality. And quality requires these things. Someone somewhere along the way is going to have to pay for it. Apple comes up the most in the last 20 years as this iconic organization and company for investing in good design and making good design happen. But one part of that that's not usually discussed is why Apple chose to do this. Apple's first computers, the Apple I, the Apple II, were not particularly easy to use by conventional standards. They had some advantages, some things about them that were cool, but very quickly all their competitors caught up to those things. So companies like Dell and IBM and Compaq were able to make computers that were cheaper because they made them at larger scale. So one of the reasons why Apple chose to invest in design was they needed a business pathway that would allow them to compete. And they bet the company inherently on the prospect of if we have better designs, we invest in making higher quality products, we can maybe get people to pay more money for it pay more money. The, the Macintosh, the, the, all the, the, the MacBooks, they all cost more. People are paying more because that's the value proposition that Apple markets based on. Someone has to pay more. Now, Apple could have done this and had a higher premium product and people would have said, no, it's not worth it. Just we're not going to pay for that. Many products you have seen that you as designers or people who are interested in design, you appreciate design, I'm sure you've seen products that you appreciated, that you thought were worth the money, that failed in the market. People were not willing to pay to get that improved design. So another example that's a little more common, we don't talk about it, it common in, in terms of what happened, but we don't talk about it that much in design circles, is the story of Niel, Nils Boland, who is the inventor of the modern version of the three-point seatbelt. Now, he was an engineer working on aircraft safety systems for pilots, including test pilots. So he had designed these systems that were very intricate and involved, and he took on the challenge of figuring out how you design a system that's simple enough that an everyday ordinary citizen could use it. Something just required one hand to use, and it's an elegant design. Now, Volvo hired him to work on that design for, for, for seatbelts, and he developed it over a, a few years. They actually released it as a, they had a patent for it, and they decided this invention was so important for society that it should be free. The surprising thing, given our history today, surprising thing is that nobody wanted it. They released it in 1959 and nobody wanted it. Car companies didn't want it because probably they were afraid it would show the liability they had for cars being unsafe. If they were to adopt it, they'd be saying to their whole, all the, all the consumers that our cars are unsafe and you should get this thing to make them safer. So they were not that excited about it. And customers and citizens weren't excited either. What happens with new technologies and new designs, it takes time for society to understand their real impacts. So it took years and years before there was enough information and data to convince society that car accidents killed people and were dangerous and required better safety designs in them. So in America, that's the chronology you see here. It took until 1968 until there was regulation that required seatbelts just to be in the cars, just to be, they were mandatory to be in the car, the government had to do it. Then it took another 16 years before one state in the United States, New York State, actually decided to say it was mandatory to use the seatbelt. Little by little, other states came along the way. So here's an example of a much better design. A design in some ways that's way more important than what Apple did. This is design that saves your lives, saves your children's lives. And people just weren't willing to pay for it. They were not willing to pay for it. It took a long, long, long time of society developing the values to say this is something that's worthwhile. And so in our everyday experience, whenever we experience something that's badly designed, we often initially blame the organization. We're like, why these clamshell packages? That's the picture shown here, where you go and you buy the thing and you take it home. And it's basically like impenetrable to open. It's like, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a joke. It's like someone's on candid camera, you know, video, putting you on YouTube, trying to open the thing because of how, how long and how frustrating a process it is. But the question that's really in here, thinking like a designer, is someone has to pay. We have this, these designs because they're cheap. If we wanted a better design, would we be willing to pay $3 more so we get a nice cardboard, fully recyclable package that's easy to open? 
Would it be worth it to us? Would we do that? In some cases, yes. In other cases, we tend to feel like, you know what? Why should I pay more? The company making it should have fewer profits. They should eat the cost for this. And in some markets, for some products, that's the result that happens. But often, good design, the ideas are there. There's a designer with better knowledge, sometimes within these organizations, but nobody's willing to pay for it. And that's where we end up where we are. And a lot of the problems we've had in the last 15 years, much like cars, they didn't recognize the design problems cars created. It took us time to recognize the design problems that social media has created with misinformation, with all the algorithmic biases against people of different ethnic backgrounds that go on Google search, and all these, all these services. But those services are free. So these corporations have to have someone to pay their bills. We have their, all their profits. They need income. So their choices, design choices, are constrained in some ways by the business model of having things be free. To, this, to sum all this up, when we look at the world, we want a better design world. Somewhere in the equation, someone has to be willing to do it. It's either going to be the organization that makes the product or service. It either has to be the customer to pay more or the government to subsidize, or in the examples I gave, at least to regulate and enforce better designs happening. But if those three won't do it, it's not a design problem anymore. The good design ideas exist. The good design plans are out there. But the value, the values, the, 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 the moral value, or just, just the desire for better design isn't there. That's the real problem then. Thinking about who is going to pay. Somebody has to pay to make design better. And within your organization, your team, your project, your family, it could be you're trying to get a better design for your living room. You want to remodel your kitchen. Someone has to value that design in order for that progress to happen. And that's usually the harder part of the design problem the value part, which leads us to power. We can't really talk about design and progress and the future of things without talking about power. So I want to ask you just to get your perception of power. Let's do the third poll. Uh, how do you feel about the amount of power that you have in your, in your work or in your life, in situations that you have to deal with where you have an idea for something, you're trying to make it happen. Do you feel you have enough power all the time that you're really an empowered person? Maybe some of the time, or maybe um, it's not that often that um, you feel you have enough authority or influence over the work being done to make good things happen and make your ideas happen. So I'm gonna take a sip of water while I wait to see what your answers are in this poll. So let's see. So, wow, 20% of you are super empowered. You always feel, I think a lot of you 20% are not married because if you were married, you would know for sure you are not always empowered. Um, sometimes that makes sense. That's right in the sweet spot, 66%. 13% rarely. Um, sorry for you folks. And then we have one person who's never feels they have power. I'm sorry, my friend. Uh, Mr. or Miss Never, um, we should talk. Um, maybe there's something we can do. Maybe the rest of us can grant some of our power. We, we should get some of the always people to distribute some of their power to the not so often and, and the nevers. So the powerful decide, what does this mean? Well, let, let, the best way I can explain what this means is to tell you a couple of stories. Or actually, you know what? To, to ask you about stories that you experience. So this is the city grid map of San Francisco. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that there is a stretch of, there's a stretch of, uh, you know, a street right here that cuts through the middle that divides the city in two different designs, which seems really weird. Like, why would somebody choose to do that? That's adding confusion. It creates, you know, streets that end, T intersections. No one wants to drive in a T intersection, a dead end. Think through in your daily life or maybe in a different neighborhood that you've lived in that was very urban and dense, I'm sure you can think of some place that you know of that was like this, where once you crossed over a certain avenue, everything just changed. Now, why does that happen? It's a common occurrence in cities, especially in American cities. You can see it in almost every one. In fact, I can show you another diagram here. Uh, let me erase my annotation so you can see it better. 
Uh, this is Seattle, Washington. And Seattle, Washington has the same, this is where I live, uh, right here, right in core of downtown, there's this big divide. So what's going on there? Who, who would choose to do this? I mean, even someone without a lot of urban planning training would know better than to do this, that you have to go out of your way to make something like this happen. So I'm gonna to explain to you why these things happen and it has to do with the title of this lesson, has to do with power. So this is Missoula, Montana, present day Missoula, Montana. And it has an extreme version of this problem where the core grid is rotated in this very strange way. Why'd that happen? I'll tell you why. Going back to the founding of the city of Missoula, when American settlers displaced the Native Americans from this land and took it over, the, these roads developed, these old country roads, and one of them was on this angle. Uh, it's called the Old Country Road. Landowners saw this old country road, and they decided this could be property that would be valuable someday. If this trading road becomes really important, it could become the anchor for the city. So they bought this land. The land to the north was owned by somebody else. This judge who owned this land had been there longer, and he liked the layout of the orientation that his land had. He also knew that the landowners to the south, these newer landowners, might have the idea of creating a South Missoula, creating a different township, dividing up the, the tax base and all the power structure for the area. So there was some tension about what the future design of the city was going to be like. And it came to a head as these things often do eventually when some other decision had to be made. There was a bridge to the Northeast that had to be rebuilt and they could decide to orient it based on the diagonal or based on the North-South line. They put it to a vote and all the citizens who were eligible to vote voted and they chose to go with the North-South line. Doesn't sound all that exciting. It seems like, okay, well, yeah, these choices happen. Great, what's the big deal? Well. What happened was what usually happens is in organizations and on products and with services is that once a new decision is made for a new direction, there's still all the legacy old direction that's still left around that people are still using and experiencing it. And it takes a lot of money and resources to even try to attempt to redesign all of those things. You know how disruptive it would be to take a functioning city and to shut down all of those streets so you could reorient them on a new angle, which, was the, which would be a, a better one, it'd be enormously expensive. No politician would want to do it. So you make the best of it. That's generally what is done. The design choice is to make the best of what these two powerful people decided. Now, why those two powerful people get the right to make these choices? They weren't urban planners. They weren't architects. They weren't like any of you. They weren't design curious and listening to webinars on a Tuesday afternoon about the greatest design lessons. They, they, who gave them the right to make these decisions that would have such profound effects on a city? And the answer is, by virtue of them having power, that gave them the right. Regardless of how much design knowledge they had, regardless of how much architectural knowledge, regardless of what their goals and motivations were. And that is the normal state of things in the world. The people who have power have their own reasons for why they chose to be there. And those reasons might be good ones, but they have their own training and background and biases and skill limitations that came along the way with them. So you end up with Missoula, Montana's. So we could hire you. I could hire any of you to be the VP of design and innovation for the town of Missoula. And you would inherit this intersection. And you have a limited budget to try to fix the problems you know are fundamental. What would you do? You do the best that you could. And so that explains a lot of the bad design that we see in the world. We, all these examples we love to call out in the design community, we make fun of them. It's just idiotic and incompetent. These parking signs and, and bad interfaces for websites. How could they do it? How could they violate these usability principles as if the person who made the sign had supreme power over all the laws and regulations and organizations and systems that are behind the logic that leads to what the sign has to do. And so we do this all the time. Designers are often naive in a way, and we imagine this perfect world that other designers work in that doesn't have any of the politics or any of the challenges that our worlds do. It'd be much smarter for us to think about design as the output of the capacity for an organization. And organizations are designed. 
They're designed to lean towards certain outcomes and to work against other outcomes. And so it's not a surprise when you look at a cartoon like this, which is a fascinating way to think about organizational culture is what, 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 are an, what would an honest org chart look like? You look down at Apple and by having a centralized core of power, you have one person who's the, the figurehead at least, who's driving a lot of creative decisions. That's a centralized way to make sure that one voice or one vision is carried through all the decisions. But most organizations aren't like that. Most divisions in organizations aren't like that. There's often a very large distribution of power, especially creative power. And that means the work that any one designer can do is limited and gated on these other factors of power. Now, there's this running joke among websites and people who work in design see this stuff all the time, that the organizational design is what shows up to the end user. And it's usually a mistake. So one of those running jokes is from XKCD, the great uh, comic, that you go to any university website, which is a classic example of this, on the front page of a campus website are all the things that the organization of the university, each individual group thinks is important. The slideshow, alumni news, which to the outside world, most of the people who visit that website could, couldn't care, they could care less about. They're there for entirely different reasons. They want to know where to park. They want to know the admissions requirements, maybe. They want to know how do I, how do I, what's the address, this functional information they want. And so you end up with these designs that may look okay, but are entirely broken for the normal use cases of these things. And it's not because the web designer for the Wake Forest University website was incompetent. It was because they had to follow the whims of the people who were in power, which clearly looks like, given how much is about news, the news organization inside the university is really powerful, as is the magazine, because those are the three things that get the most real estate and exposure on the screen. So you're, getting, you're being witness to the organization through the design, which is a mistake. And a lot of what goes on in organizations is petty high school level politicking, that there's just two leaders who hate each other. So if the leader of the product planning team and the leader of the engineering team just don't get along, what effect do you think that's going to have on design decisions? It's going to be a nightmare. And so that's defining the design. That has way more influence over the design quality than any design methodology you're using or any design book that you're referencing, because that force is far more powerful. And it works specific to designers too that you could hire the most talented, skilled designer in the universe, in the whole universe. So it could be some alien species that can do eight dimensional design and has a you know, quadruple diamond process method that they use. But if they're stuck down in the mailroom, the bottom of the org chart, it doesn't really matter how talented they are because their ability to influence power and decision-making power is terribly limited. So the organization has to mature to allow for design quality to happen so that the power structure enables good design to happen. And that that designer has a seat at the table, which is just table stakes. It doesn't mean they have any influence, but there's the potential for them to gain influence. So they maybe get more resources and can hire a user researcher to better understand the usage of the website and on and on it goes to actually get on the path where design skills that we talk about so much, aesthetics, usability, doing user studies. So those things can ever even matter. Powerful to decide. Which leads to lesson number four. Lesson number four is that good design depends on context. This will be obvious to you, perhaps. Of course, it depends on context. I'm a designer, I, or I'm an architect, or I, I think about design problems. Yes, it depends on context. This sounds obvious. Let me explain a little more why this is so important that it's number four in my list of the great, the great lessons. This is a different list of great lessons. This is Dieter Ram's design uh, his design heuristics. And Dieter Rams was, is, is a legendary designer. He worked at Braun, which is an engineering electronics, consumer electronics company, uh, very important in the 60s and 70s, very influential in their design style, influencing Apple and many other prominent companies today. So just take a second to look at his design heuristics. If you're familiar with them, that's great. If you're new to them, that's fine. These are meant to be suggestions for people making stuff 
for how they should think about what is good. Just take a look at it and see what resonates with you. Now, a lot of these are nice. It's hard to look at this and be upset. Of course, I want my thing to be useful. Of course, I want it to be aesthetic and good looking. Of course, I want it to be unobtrusive. There's no person in the world, an engineer, a manager, a business leader, who starts a project and says, you know, the goal for this project is going to be to make something really obtrusive. Like, <laughs> that, like that's our, and we want it, we want it to be useless. We, want, we don't want anybody to use it. So my problem with these sorts of heuristics is that they are almost platitudes. They don't give you any real information about the kind of traps you can fall into when you're making stuff. So we, ad we admire these, we put them on the wall, but they're not really helping us catch a common mistake, which is about context. So I want to talk about the context of hammer design for a minute. So indulge me in this fantasy that we're all working together at a hammer startup. <laughs> we want to disrupt the hammer industry and we're going to build a team of engineers and business leaders and designers and uh, marketers. We're going to build a whole team, but the mission for our goal, we're going to we want to revolutionize hammers. And so we start talking as a group or brainstorming. And of course, we're going to talk about Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. And if you've seen any of the 60,000 Avenger movies, I'm sure you're familiar now with Thor's hammer. And it's an amazing piece of hammer technology. It's probably the best, most fascinating hammer ever conceived. It has all these features. It's indestructible. It can fly, uh, returns on command through the air. It can summon lightning. If you are a fan of um, the comic books, it has this laundry list of other features. It can do all kinds of cool things. And so for us, as people who have come together to work together, commit our lives for a year or more to build the best hammer, this is like a cool hammer. This is, this is great. This is the, the cutting edge of hammer innovation. And so we're, this is what we're thinking about. We want to make a great hammer. And if we think about Dieter Ram's heuristics, is this innovative? Yes. Is it aesthetic? Yes. It's beautiful. All those attributes, we can look at this and be, yeah. We're making something that's great. And as we do research, we, we look at the ordinary $10 Home Depot hammer. And by comparison, it's just, okay. Um, yeah, it, put hammers into the wall. Uh, sorry, put, put nails into the wall. Putting a hammer into the wall would be a whole nother problem. It has a nice custom, you know, comfy grip. It's orange, so I guess it's harder to lose. It's just really boring. It's just uh, like, I don't know, hard to get excited about that. We built this company to do hammer disruption. And this is just seems like really boring. And so um, it sets us up for a trap. Uh, those abstract aesthetics, of abstract heuristics about design set us up for a trap. We're going to appreciate really what we want, what we're interested in, because we can justify the heuristics based on that. Hans Holen, he was an artist and architect. He made this amazing photograph showing the diversity of a hammer. He showed in his photograph maybe 25 different examples of hammers. But there's an infinite number of hammers. You could have ones that have Bluetooth uh, in them that capture how many calories you burn as you strike the hammer. There's an infinite number of ways you can make hammers. And he made this picture to illustrate that what, what would you say about these? What would you say? Which, which hammers are good? Which hammers are bad? What's the best hammer? And if you look at this, at first you might have an answer and an, and an opinion, probably based on your own sensibility, hammer innovation. But as you look at it, you have to realize, oh, there are actually lots of different purposes for hammers. And without talking about the context for the hammer design prototype, we really can't say anything about whether that hammer is good or bad. You could do, you know, hammer number one, the first hammer over here, right? This is, this is something you'd use, really delicate work, probably making art, sculpting something really care, putting your initials in, in something you're going to give as a gift, something really delicate. And then way down over here, we have something that's bigger than a person. You, if you're really strong to hold and it's really crude, it's meant to smash and destroy things. So depending on the task, one of these is going to be great and one of them is going to be horrible. 
but that's not in the hammer itself. It's in the context. And that's the point of this lesson is that we too often and too easily fall into the trap of falling in love with the thing and our appreciation of the thing. Your CEO at your, at the CEO of our hammer, a startup company might be in love with this because that's just the kind of stuff he's interested in or she's interested in. And her biases are going to tilt the direction of the project towards what he or she wants. But if we knew something about this blue design, that maybe the actual needs for the majority of our intended customers, we go and we do research and we observe them working. We see what their needs actually are. That's probably the one that's going to most likely serve their needs and solve their problem, even if it's boring to us. And then, of course, the bottom, maybe it turns out that our most vocal customer not the most representative, but the most vocal customer has that need. And if we're not careful, our most vocal customer will bias us towards a very small part of our audience. To look at a picture like this, this is a design research question, design research, user research. You can't make a decision now in good faith to yourself without looking and asking questions about what's the content? Who are these people? What are we designing? for. And that leads us down the path then whenever we talk about things like intuitive or easy to use, we often apply that as a label to the thing. This fighter, co fighter pilot cockpit, we look at, wow, super complex. That must be bad. What's the context? If you're a fighter pilot, whose li your life depends on your ability to do things instantly and quickly, including complex things, you might be willing to do a year of training so that you're so good that this becomes the best, most efficient way to, to work, as opposed to you're an eight-year-old girl who wants to play on your Xbox. You want to play a flying game. This is not going to be the UI. It's going to be fun to play with. This menu, is this menu good? I couldn't tell you. I don't speak Chinese. I don't know. I need to know a lot more then about what the context is for us to evaluate what good or bad is. And so heuristics like this, a lot of design literature focuses on these abstractions and it divorces us and pulls us away from really the goal of having better design in the world, which has to be context specific. So all these terms that are still today, the most well-known terms when talking about design, you can also talk about aesthetics in here too. What's cool? Cool is also context-based, intuitive, easy to use, user-friendly. These are all dangerous terms when they're context-free. They also deny our obligation to think about people who are different from us that we will naturally exclude if we're thinking about what's cool, we're thinking about intuitive as a principle imbued into the design rather than being contextual. So all kinds of traps are wrapped up here. We forget the context, which unfortunately happens a lot of the time. And so my last lesson for you, and then we will have time for Q and A. And I'll hear, you can tell me what you think some of the better lessons are. Ask me why I didn't talk about X or Y. Design for sale and design for use. Design for sale is all the things that go on to help you want to buy something. And that's important. Someone has to pay, right? We need money to fund and pay for a design. So sales is important. It should be thought of as related to design. Design for use is what happens when you actually get the thing. One of my favorite examples for thinking about design for use and design for sale is Ikea. I'm an Ikea fan. I like Ikea. I own a lot of Ikea furniture. It's a great user experience to go to the store. People spend a lot of money and time designing that experience, but it's an experience for sale. You're there to go there and they're hoping you're going to be, have a good time, have some great Swedish meatballs and buy some stuff and go home. You go there, look, everything is great. It's all built for you. It's affordable, stylish. You come home. And then you're met with a different experience. The thing you bought now is not complete. To use it, you have work to do. And now the beginning of your design for use begins. And this is a very different experience than design for sale. You may have work to do. You may have some surprises about how the thing actually functions. And when we talk about design for the world, we want the world to be better, things in the world to be better, it has to be an integration of good design for sale so these good ideas can be viable, but combined with good design for use. If it's all designed for sale, we're disappointed, we're frustrated, we're not happy, the world doesn't actually improve, but you need them both. So um, to think of this in, in, in a more precise way, 
there are these characteristics in the totality of things in the world. Design for sale usually involves things in the moment. What's the price for this? How many features does it have? It's easier to sell based on number of features as opposed to number of actual solutions for you. You could buy a new mobile app that has 70 features that all claim to be valuable. You try to use it and only two of them are actually things you'd ever use more than once. But in the moment for sale, you're not going to be thinking about that. To do design for sale well, you want people to make impulsive decisions and to think in terms of their dreams. What's the potential future you would have if you got this car? How much better your life would be if you installed this app? That's the basis for sale. But the basis for, for reality, for the world we want, the better world we want, is all about use and it's more rational. It's more logical. It's based on a lot of the fundamental design principles that are commonly taught. Dieter Ram's heuristics fall into this, things that last a long time, things that have value, things that are unobtrusive. But you only get success in design when these things are brought together. And that's where some of our problems with who's a designer and who's not a designer works against good design. Because to achieve all these characteristics, it's design kinds of design work done by advertisers, done by marketers, done by engineers, done by product people, done by managers, done by executives. It's all the totality of all these things and how they integrate and how they come together. But too often designers think primarily of design for use and denigrate anyone who's working on design for sale. A lot of designers of products never want to talk to the sales team. That seems as, oh, they're just going to sell whatever I make because my what I design is going to be so good, it'd be easy to sell. And those are people who clearly have never tried to sell anything because sales is actually really hard. In some ways, it's much harder than design and creative work. And so those are my five design lessons. Design is quality. Someone has to pay. The powerful design, good depends on context and design for sale and design for use are integrated and integral to how we make the world a better place. The last thing I want to leave you with as a thank you for tuning in today to listen to me lecture you, give you my opinion about the greatest design lessons. I'm really on this mission to help make design better. That's why I wrote the book, How Design Makes the World. All the stories I've told you today come from that book. All the lessons are derived from material in the book. So the book itself serves as a way to help more people understand this stuff. But if you're here, you are personally interested in making the world better. And I want to help you more. So there's resources that are bonuses from the book. They, they stand alone. They do refer back to the book. There's an insider's guide to evangelizing design. So if you're in an organization which understood design better, that's the handbook for you. If you yourself find yourself trying to explain the same concepts over and over again about design, that, that, that guidebook is for you. And if you have any interest in using the book as a tool for discussing these topics, I wrote a discussion guide that makes it easy for anyone to facilitate a conversation around these ideas with your coworkers or your team to help bring those ideas and concepts and make them actively work to making design better and design maturity more likely in your organization. You get all those things at the URL at the bottom. So um, what you can do, well, get the book for you and your team. Obviously my mom who's here, she can tell you herself, um, if, if she thinks the book is good, she told me it is, but we'll see what she says to you. And you'll get on the mailing list if you get those bonus resources. And you'll get more information from me about uh, more design stories and more ways to make design part a better part of the world. And we can have a better, more better design world in the future. So that's my last slide. And um, thanks you all for paying attention and hanging out. And it's uh, it's been great and fun to chat with you and for um, have you listen to my answer all my crazy poll questions. So thanks. So Scott, we had one more poll question. Did you want to find out what people's favorite of the five design oh, lessons Oh, yes, were? I do. Uh, thank you, Becky. Yeah, I'd love to know. Uh, why don't we put that poll up? Go ahead and do it. So what was your favorite lesson? Was it design is quality? Someone has to pay. The powerful decide. Good depends on context or design for sale and for use. I know which one my favorite is, but I won't. I'm yeah, I'm curious to hear, but don't tell me before we I close won't. the poll. Yeah, I won't. I, I'm going to wait to see what everyone else votes on. Um, and I have a, I have a favorite too. So we'll give everyone a few more seconds. 
and some really amazing comments throughout today's event. Scott, I know you're going to have fun catching up with those in the chat later. Um, it looks like I do have someone with their hand raised with a question. Um, for, for the gentleman who raised his hand, if you could put that question in the chat, I'd be happy to ask Scott the question for you. Um, and let's take a look at these uh, poll results. Uh, it looks like the overwhelming favorite is good, depends on context. Wow, yeah. I, I'm pleased to see that they're just pretty well distributed. I was going to make a joke that my favorite one is the last one, because when I say that one, then I'm almost done. <laughs> so I'm always excited about that one. I'm like, yes, I'm at the tail end. I get to actually hear questions now, which is a lot of always a lot more fun for me. Uh, for sure. So I had two favorites. I thought the uh, stuff that you were calling out about the design of cities and the power struggle for that was really interesting. Um, and I also love the um, perspective of the design for sale versus the design for use. Yeah. Um, so uh, I see there are some questions in here. Let's, let's, uh, let's, yeah, let's go to those. Go. Um, all right. So Mar uh, Marcy's wondering how this applies to nonprofits, especially in the context of fundraising. Yeah. So nonprofits are, very well nonprofits are a kind of designed organization too nonprofits have a, a nonprofits are, are harder in part because so many people who work there are doing their are there on a volunteer basis and volunteerism means the pol political challenges are often a lot harder to motivate people and to get people to be willing to do stuff is often a lot harder so organizations that are nonprofits have a different value system and a different motivation system i'd say that fundamentally the challenges are the same you have people with different levels of power who have to agree to create experiences for the people who visit the website or show up at the events. The experience they have to have has to be unified and clear. And if you can't get that kind of agreement among leaders, you're going to have events that aren't well run. You're going to have a website that's confusing and hard to find the place to donate the money, which should be the easiest thing to do. So you have those challenges and they're just, there's a lot harder. Your ability to understand group politics and to influence people becomes a lot harder. I'd recommend a book. There's a book called Influence Without Authority. That is a great book for getting better at understanding those dynamics. When you have a role, you're not in charge, but you need to influence people who have authority in order to help them to do better things. Thank you, Scott. And I want to make sure, I don't think you talked about the slide, uh, but we would love if you're on this call uh, for you to help us promote this book, How Design Makes the World. And one of the ways is to buy the book for your team. And Scott's mom even already uh, said in the chat that uh, she thinks the books are good and it's not just because uh, she's his mom. And then also uh, joining the mailing list to get those bonus resources is another way to help uh, spread the message of this book. Um, so here's a question from Michael Williams. He says, Scott, is this another design lesson? the idea of designing the design team. It seems like one of the fundamental things that an organization can do to create innovative designs is start with the right team and the right goals. Absolutely. And just to think of it that way is important. I think a lot of people become design leaders or managers in part because they're the most experienced designer on the team. But leading a team and organizing a team is a very different kind of challenge. I do consider it a design challenge, but it's very different than designing pixels or user interfaces. You're designing with people. You're designing relationships. And there's no guarantee that because you're good at designing in Photoshop or with Figma that you're going to be good at designing relationships or how teams of people are going to work. And uh, that can often be the real inhibiting factor is the most talented designer on your team is not going to be the best manager or leader. And putting the person who's better fit for that role in place is a – Again, it's pow the powerful decide. How, who's going to decide who plays that role? Who's going to decide how the team is organized? If the team isn't functioning well, then it's not a problem of design talent. The problem is that your team is not your team is dysfunctional, and um, that's often the reason why we have the roadblocks that we do. Again, that design is has to be in the context of the team. It's not separated out in its own its own thing. Got it. So here's an interesting comment from Janelle who says, I recently left a company that focused on design for sale and had a hard time recognizing that they didn't consider design for use. And okay, two questions here. Uh, we'll try to get to both of them and maybe we'll even have time for more. Uh, Mark is asking, uh, Scott, how do you think good design might transform our moribund schools today? Well, I think um, 
schools are one of these things. I remember when I was younger, I used to complain about schools all the time with just these basic things I thought were broken. Like, why isn't this course taught? Or why don't we learn about this thing? And I did that in complete ignorance of how school systems work <laughs> and how political they are and how the role that parents play in both pushing for progress sometimes, but also inhibiting progress. It's a supremely political and sensitive topic. And it's not a question of who has good ideas. It's how do you get the, the, the political capital and the respect and the reputation and over time build up organizations. This is, you know, we're talking about institutions now over years and decades so they can support and provide this a better quality of education over the long term. We too often think of it like a technology that we can just upgrade. We're going to upgrade our schools and magically we're going to transform all these people and all their sensibilities and all their attitudes simply because we have a better idea. That's just not how human nature works. So the challenge of schools, I think, has to be done in the small. You have far more ability to experiment and make change happen in the small. And then you learn there and you're able to grow and find examples that other groups can emulate and borrow from. That's really the story of how innovation happens too. You can't innovate in the grand. It's just too hard to do. You need smaller examples where you can show it works well and then have people copy it. Thanks for that, Scott. So we have a couple of questions here related to design thinking. Luis is wondering what your opinion is about design thinking. And Donald is wondering, is design thinking an example of design for sale rather than design for use? Those are great questions. So design thinking, I've, I'm ambivalent about it. On the one hand, it has been good. I mentioned early on in this talk that design is often seen as a static thing. It's just this layer on top. So design thinking is the first popular example I've seen in my lifetime it's design it's now exposed oh designers actually have a process they have to do this they have to do research they have to empathize they have to prototype it's blown out design there's actually a series of steps someone has to follow that's been good it has elevated people's perception of what design even is the bad part is it has also sometimes trivialized it that you can go get a certificate in design thinking and now people think oh i don't need to hire designers anymore i could i have a design thinking certificate what they don't realize, and it's a problem of the way design thinking is taught, is that design thinking isn't design doing. The fact that you know the steps for doing brain surgery doesn't mean you're an experienced brain surgeon who's not going to kill people. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's still the gap that we have. That the fact you know the process doesn't mean that you've done it 100 times, which is probably how many times you need to do it in order to start doing it well. Design thinking can be for design for sale. So as one of you asked, that organizations can say, hey, we, we, we took a design thinking course, so now our products must be usable, right? No, <laughs> you just took a course. You didn't actually transform or change the way decisions are made, or more importantly, who has power. So until a design thinking course changes the power structure and gives it more to the people who are better at making those decisions, the problems are going to remain. Thank you. So I have a, a comment here from Michelle, who uh, teaches innovation at Santa Rosa Junior College and use your, uses your work all the time, uh, even gifts your book, Dance of the Possible, to all the students. Um, and she says, you're the greatest. Would love to meet you in person at some point and keep up your boundless energy. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was sweet. That's why I read it. <laughs> so here's a question from Noah, probably the last one we have time to take. He wants to know uh, how much context is enough. There's always a bigger context around any specific specific problem and digging into those contexts can be daunting. And the common re resistance is, look, there's no end to this and we don't have forever to explore. Um, let's just get something done right now. So how do you decide when you've gotten enough context for the design there, problem? There is, there's no mathematical formula to answer this question. It's a fair one to ask. It suggests at least some context is being considered in research, which is great. So you're ahead of the curve on that. It's one of these questions, though, that the more that you do, you never know what new thing you're going to discover. So you're making a trade-off. We make these trade-offs in life all the time. Uh, how many people are you going to date before you get engaged? Are you going to just one person, three people, five? How many is enough? Is there a better person out there maybe that you're not, you haven't met yet? You don't know for sure. And you can do certain, you want to do a certain amount of exploration. Uh, what, what career should you have? Similar problem. First career that comes to mind, just spend $200,000 getting a degree for it? Or should you explore and experiment first? These are trade-off questions. You're never going to get an, an answer that's fully satisfying. You want to always try to be in the sweet spot where you've done some, 
You're starting to feel like you're getting redundant answers and maybe now's the time to move on. And then you make some decisions. And when the project's over, you go back and look and ask yourself, would more research and more context seeking have helped us? And then you have a better, then your, your estimation now is better for the next time. And that's the best that we can hope to do uh, with these problems. I'm not suggesting multiple marriages or career switches. I'm just saying <laughs> as problem spaces, that's, these are problem spaces that you're never going to have a completely satisfying, perfect mathematical answer for. Thank you so much, Scott. So before we end today's webinar, I do want to remind all of you to stay in touch with Scott at scottberkin.com. Go out and get this book today. And Scott, any parting wisdom for us as we wrap up the hour Hey, together? thank you all for coming. I love talking about design. If you have a design story or question that didn't get covered today, my website is how you get in touch with me. There's a contact button there. Drop me a line. Say, hey, what about this? Do you know about this story? I love to interact with people who spent the time to come in and, 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 and listen to me uh, opine today. So thanks for, thanks for all you for coming. And I wish you a better design world tomorrow.